Welcome dear students, this is Shupratik Shil from Department of Zoology back with the discussion on the topic rather on the module of sericulture. In our previous discussion, we talked about salient aspects of this particular topic as a part of, uh, sorry, Arik Badjachi. Welcome dear students, this is Shupratik Shil from the Department of Zoology coming back with the discussion on different aspects of sericulture. In our previous class, in our previous video, we talked about salient aspects of sericulture. Today we will continue discussion on certain other topics, certain new topics on this particular aspect. Today we will also talk about many new things as a part of the skill enhancement course as per the recommendation of UG Websu CBCS syllabus of third semester zoology honors course. So let us continue discussion on various aspects of sericulture. Hope you have gone through the previous video which had been uploaded in the YouTube channel and you already have the idea about different learning outcomes from the knowledge perspective as well as the professional goals. I hope you all are interested in this particular professional goals uh, in future. We already have talked about the introductory note of sericulture means the sericulture is uh, sericulture what is all about as well as the history of the sericulture. We also talked about the silkworm biology where we talked from different entomological aspects. Today we will continue discussion on the topics of silk properties and the moriculture. Silk properties here we will be finding the biochemistry of silk the voltainism and different types of Indian silk which are uh, in market. As well as we will be talking about moriculture means the mulberry cultivation which is very important and inevitable part of sericulture. Later on we will also talk about sericulture practices like the procedure by which the silkworm are reared in India as well as different pests and parasites which are challenges for the sericulture. We also be talking about the prospects of sericulture both from the perspective of our own state West Bengal as well as from the perspective of our country and also the entrepreneurship opportunities in sericulture field. So let us continue the discussion on today's topic. Today we will first talk about the properties of silk but before going to the core part of the discussion we should remember or let us consider that silk is considered as queen of all fiber. So you should remember that silk is a very very noble kind of fiber that is obtained from natural sources from the silk moth cocoons and this particular protein this particular cocoon is consisting of two different types of proteins the fibroin and the sericin. We also will be considering different other types of fibers. So you know that we have different types of textile fibers which are the part of the fashion technology as well as the uh, as well as the textile industry. We can obtain the fibers from different natural sources and from different man-made or anthropogenic sources. So as a part of the anthropogenic sources, there are two different types of fibers. One is the regenerated kind of fiber. Another one which is available in the market is the synthetic type of fiber. As a part of natural fibers, we can get uh, the fibers from vegetables or plant sources as well as from the minerals and from the animals. The chief two fibers are cotton fibers which uh, you know we all use the cotton cloths and cotton products as well as the linen products which we get from the plants. From the animals chiefly we get two different types of fibers. One is the wool uh, which we make uh, our woolen wear and the second one is the silk which is the topic of discussion for our class and for this particular course. Silk can be of two types the mulberry type and the non mulberry type which can be also considered as the wild type of silk and the mulberry silk can be obtained from bombyx mori species again the quality of this particular species can uh, vary based on the life cycle pattern 
it may be bivoltine type and multivoltine type and you already have the idea that the bivoltine type of silk is much more superior than the multivoltine type of silk. And there are certain non mulberry type of species also like we can get the tussar silk, the muga silk, airy silk. You can see that I have already displayed four different types of silks which are produced chiefly in our country. The first one is the mulberry silk commonly known as the pure silk in the market. Second is the muga, then the airy silk and the last one is the tussar silk. Now let us consider the composition of the silk. If you just do the cross section of a single silk fiber, you will be finding that there are two chief proteins. One is a fibroin protein, another one is a sericin protein. And if you just consider the chemical composition of these proteins, then you will be finding that there are a lot of beta pleated sheets which are forming the peptidal structures or rather peptidal conformational organization and making these proteins okay and um, the fibroin protein uh, is consisting of or rather constituting approximately 70 percent to 75 percent of the whole silk fiber whereas the sericin is contributing for 25 percent to the 30 percent certain waxy substances are also there like um, which is contributing for 2 to 3 percent and because of the presence of these waxy substances you can see the glossy nature of silk. Then there are certain natural colors though we can get lot of uh, colorful silk cloths in our market but there are certain natural colors which are giving the cocoon fibers its real color and this contribute about 1 to 1.5 percent of the whole composition of a silk fiber and there are certain uh, certain minerals uh, present in this particular fiber. Here you can see that there are two structures, one is the fibroin structure, fibroin protein, another one is the sericin protein below uh, the screen you can see that these two uh, proteins are the chief components of the silk. Next I was talking about the cross section of a silk fiber you can see that this is the electron microscopic picture of a sericin and the fibroin consisting of a silk cross section. So you can see that the sericin protein is, is constituting the outer layer of this silk fiber whereas the fibroin protein is constituting the core portion of the silk fiber. If you just unwind a cocoon silk worm, you will be finding a silk thread and this silk thread which is consisting of the sericin layer is not only just consisting of a single layer but the sericin layer is divided into three major parts. The outer sericin layer, the middle sericin layer and the inner sericin layer. And the fibroin filament, the fibroin part I have already mentioned that it is constituting the core part of the silk. The fibroin is consisting of multiple filaments and fibrils, presence of microfibrils and these microfibrils are the aggregate of different protein polymers. Now let us consider the characteristics of the silk fiber. Silk is mainly consisting of fibroin and sericin though I have mentioned that there are certain other ingredients or there are certain other components constituting uh, say a silk fiber but chiefly we can consider that the fibroin protein is constituting uh, 80 percent of the silk fiber, sericin protein is constituting the 20 percent of a silk fiber and then uh, then the whole silk fiber we are getting to find. Silk can withstand a great pulling pressure okay, because of the presence of a property which is called the tensile strength. It ranges between 30.9 to 44.1 centi newton per tex. So this is the parameter by which we can measure the tensile strength of the silk fiber. Silk fabric can retain its shape because of the moderate resilience property to wrinkling. It has the elasticity as well as resilience which will be giving it excellent drapability like unlike the other fibers. However, silk is more plastic because of the presence of the crystalline polymers. Okay? So the crystalline polymers which are the ingredient or rather which are the constituents of this particular silk fiber will be giving it a more plastic nature okay? and um, except some amorphous region I should also mention this particular point. 
silk is a soft kind of clothing or silk is a soft kind of textile and uh, because of the presence of waxy substances which I have already mentioned in the last slide, uh, silk will allow a smooth even and regular surface kind of feeling and a luster kind of feeling because of its uh, chemical composition. Silk being protein in nature, it is a poor or rather non-conductor of heat. So, if you use certain curtains or certain uh, clothes to cover up your room or if you are wearing a silk uh, clothing, you will feel much more cooler because silk has a very poor or kind of non-conductor kind of property for the heat. Silk has a good absorbency. So, if you just keep the silk clothing uh, uh, at your room, it will absorb certain amount of moisture from the atmosphere. Approximately, it can absorb 10 percent to 30 percent uh, of moisture of its weight. Silk is heat sensitive, though the silk can uh, resist uh, the heat or rather it is a poor or non-conductor of heat, but it can withstand maximum up to 140 degree Celsius after which it uh, starts to melt or decompose and at 165 degree centigrade it starts to melt. Silk fabrics get uh, weakened or loosened upon regular exposure to the sunlight. So, if you are wearing your silk clothes in, uh, uh, in exposure to sun and you are going outside, then your clothes will be becoming weakened or loosened by gradual sun exposure or gradual UV exposure. Silk fibers also get damaged by the bleaching effect. So, be careful while using the bleachings uh, to discolor or to, uh, to clean the silk products because uh, the silk are very much sensitive uh, to different bleaching products like sodium hypochlorite. But however, you can use the mild bleaches like hydrogen peroxide or H2O2, sodium perborate, etc. for the silk fabric. Silk is resistant to the mild dew that means the fungal molds. We can see that especially during the rainy season, during the monsoon, different other cloths like cotton fabric or any other uh, natural uh, fabric material is catching the mild dew or fungal molds. It is manifesting the development of different fungal molds, but the silk is resistant to mild dew. But obviously, if you just keep the silk fabric for a prolonged period, it will never gonna be resistant to the mild dew. It may catch certain fungal molds. The specific gravity of the silk fiber is only 1.25. So, from this particular value, we can guess that silk is lighter in weight in comparison to the other materials, other fabric materials. Silk can be easily damaged by alkaline solutions which are having higher com higher concentrations as well as if the solution is consisting of higher temperature. So, the use of different alkaline products, different um, uh, you know different types of washing powders, you have to choose the mild kind of uh, products like the mild alkaline products we are recommended to clean the silk cloths uh, with the help of soaps and detergents. Okay in the form of soaps and detergents. Concentrated inorganic acids like H2SO4, HNO3, HCl, etc. are not good for the silk. The silk products cannot withstand this type of uh, inorganic acids. However, the, uh, the mild organic acids or rather organic acids where the acidity is not that much corrosive, it can withstand this particular property. Due to good absorbency, silk will be showing a good affinity for the dye. So, we can get a lot of colorful silk products because of this particular property. Perspiration, this is another interesting one. If you are having perspiration issue, if you are sweating more than any other person, then your silk cloths gonna be damaged uh, due, to, uh, due to weakening and due to yellowing effect as there are salts and other ingredients present in your uh, sweat. Silk will not allow uh, the dirt on your 
uh, cloths, so it has a smooth surface. So we can clean the silk cloths, we can clean the silk product by simple washing and simple dry cleaning. So silk is favored by most of the people due to its glossy nature, due to its bright appearance for this particular property. Silk being a natural fiber may be subjected to paste, so you have to keep your silk cloths, you have to keep your um, silk products in a very good um, organized way, otherwise the larvae of the cloth moths, carpet beetles, etc. organism may damage your silk products. Now what are the advantages and disadvantages of silk? So let us focus on the advantages of using silk. Silk is obviously a luxurious fiber, so it will give a very good feel and unique kind of feel to the users. It has excellent drapability. Silk is a strong kind of fiber, but it's a lightweight kind of fiber. So that's why people are using from time imperial as a clothing product. Wonderful luster of silk has attracted people due to its property of reflecting the light, mainly because of the presence of certain proteins like the fibroin proteins, sericin proteins, as well as the waxy substances uh, are giving this particular property to the silk product. Uh, it's a dart resistant kind of, uh, you know, uh, polymer. So the silk product can be used uh, for a prolonged period without getting that much damage in comparison to cotton or any other fiber material. But uh, there are also certain disadvantages of using silk. There is a property of abrasion and resilience which may damage the silk products. Uh, the yellowing of the silk products due to uh, gradual perspiration. So I have already mentioned that if you have sweating kind of uh, body stature or body physiology, you can't use your silk products for a prolonged period. Silk is a bleaching sensitive kind of product, so you should be cautious while choosing your detergent powder or soap while cleaning the silk products. It has poor resistance to sunlight, so if you are uh, roaming in uh, exposure to the sunlight for a prolonged period, your silk cloths may get damaged. The quality of the silk may also get degraded due to the exposure of different oxidizing ingredients or oxidizing compounds in the whole atmosphere. Also the silk is not susceptible to the mildew or fungal mold attack, but if you keep the silk product for, uh, for a prolonged period in a moist or in a damp condition, it may catch the mildew or the fungal molds. Other weathering factors may also lead to the damages of the silk product. The production of the silk is a time consuming and it, it's a labor intensive procedure. So it's, uh, it's an expensive kind of fiber uh, when available in the market. Now we, all, we talked about the silk uh, and we discussed many things about the sericulture. Now let us focus on another aspect that is the moriculture. Moriculture is a field which is inevitably associated with the sericulture. But before going to the detailed discussion on this particular topic of moriculture, we should uh, go for the definition. What is moriculture is all about? In simple words, moriculture refers to the mulberry cultivation. And this particular mal moriculture word, the, if you see the etymology of this particular word, it's derived from the Latin word morus. It is a generic name of this particular plant species. So moriculture is a very, very important kind of practice from the agricultural aspect uh, which is contributing in the productivity of the sericulture. The plants of moriculture which is the mulberry, which are the mulberry plants will be growing as shrubs in tropical countries and these kinds of uh, mulberry trees are found in the temperate countries. Approximately there are 68 species of mulberry plants uh, which are belonging chiefly under the, uh, which are coming chiefly under the family of Moresi and belonging to the genera Morus. But there are more than 1000 varieties currently available under cultivation in different countries. I have highlighted uh, or I have given pictures of three major species of mulberries. The first one is the white mulberry or the Morus alba. Second one is the black mulberry or the Morus nigra. 
and the third one is the morus rubra or the red mulberry these three uh, types of variety these three species and the varieties of these three species are chiefly cultivated in our country mulberry cultivation is the agricultural part of the sericulture i have already mentioned and this is actually determining the cost of the silk because it has been estimated that approximately 60% to the 70% of the silk product cost is dependable upon the investment in the moriculture because uh, this is chiefly because the mulberry leaves are the prime food for the bombyx mori larvae i will remind you all that the bombyx mori larvae is a voracious eater because it need to gain the energy by feeding on the mulberry leaves and these energy will be utilized during the cocoon formation and later on in the imago stage proteins of mulberry leaves are very good sources of amino acid so the proteins uh, which are obtained from the mulberry leaves are getting degraded inside the guts inside the gastrointestinal tract of the mulberry uh, larvae and the amino acids which are available for the metabolism are associated are biosynthesized to form the fibroin and the sericin proteins constituting the silk fiber as well as we can also see the structural carbohydrates from the cell walls of the cells of the leaves of the mulberry uh, mulberry plants will be providing a huge amount of energy uh, to the to the larvae because these kinds of carbohydrates are very much digestible easily uh, easily you know as easily can be assimilated inside the gastrointestinal tract of these larvae now one hectare of the fertile land can produce approximately 15 to 40 tons of mulberry leaves over a period of one year so you can increase the production and if you increase the production of the mulberry plants you can directly uh, decrease the uh, price of the silk because the price of the silk is directly related with the mulberry silk production so more the mulberry silk will be getting produced lesser will be a unit and unit of uh, of a silk uh, product will be uh, available for the customer in, uh, in you know in a cheaper price okay in about 29 countries cultivation of mulberry plants is not only just for the silkworm rearing we should also acknowledge this thing that the mulberry uh, cultivation of the moriculture is not just because of the sericulture though we are discussing the relevance um, uh, in context to the sericulture but we should also acknowledge this particular uh, use where we can see that the mulberries can be used in the production of ice creams jams jellies beverages etc now uh, i have got a very interesting data from a research from csrti mysore and this particular paper highlighted that approximately 65 percent to 78 percent of a single leaf of mulberry consisting of water or moisture content then the mulberry leaf is consisting of approximately 19 percent to 25 percent of proteins which is a very good sources of amino acids for the production of fibroin and sericin in the uh, silkworm larvae uh, larvae uh, physiology secondly uh, secondly the minerals which are also contributing in formation of different uh, vitamins as well as different molecular structures uh, important for the physiological processes uh, for the growth and the development of the larvae there are certain reducing sugars also which is uh, having approximately two percentage of concent uh, two percentage of the whole concent uh, composition and also certain other sugars uh, present approximately 10 percent to 15 percent contributing in the energy expenditure of these larvae but uh, before going to the procedure of moriculture like how the mulberry cultivation is taking place uh, in a particular agricultural ground we should also consider certain factors which are important 
for the moriculture whether your soil and climatic condition is favorable for your moriculture or not. Mulberry cultivation can be done in a wide range of soil but it had been found that the mulberry plants grow best in a loamy or clay soil. So, you can guess that the mulberry plants require a good amount of water to absorb for the physiological process and for the growth and the development. The mulberry plant can tolerate slightly acidic condition in the soil. So, you should be careful, you should go for a pH test of your soil before going for the mulberry cultivation. In case of the too acidic soil where the pH is below uh, 5, you can apply dolomite or lime before uh, going for the cultivation procedure. But if your soil is alkaline, you can also apply the gypsum uh, to neutralize this particular effect. Since the mulberry is a deep rooted plant, the soil should also be sufficiently deep rooted and up to 2 feet uh, depth is a very sufficient one for the nurturing of the mulberry plants. Mulberry thrives well to about 4000 feet of altitude, but if you go to the mountain region where the height uh, from the sea level is much more, uh, the mulberry cultivation is not recommended there. Because of the soil properties, because of the climatic attributes and because of the cooler temperature. Okay. Another important aspect for the moriculture is the land properties or land attributes. Since the mulberry is a perennial crop, we need to raise the mulberry properly in the first year because the sapling in the first year need to take care well uh, uh, to uh, protect itself from different environmental hazards until it is becoming well adapted to the particular environment. Uh, mulberry can get a good yielding capacity uh, during the second year and it can give you a very, very good production till 15 years in the field. Usually flatlands are suitable for the mulberry cultivation because I have already mentioned that the mulberry plants need a well uh, or a good amount of moisture and water um, to be absorbed by the roots. So, the irrigation uh, is facilitated because of the presence of these flatlands. But if the slope is greater than 15 percent, you can also go for mulberry cultivation by using different procedures like contour bunding, bench terracing, etc. The field can be prepared by deep ploughing and the depth of this particular uh, field should be 30 centimeter to 45 centimeter in order to loosen the soil and then after you can use, uh, you can, uh, okay, so for this particular process you can use your tractor or your plough and then you can go for um, go for the removal of the weeds and stones which may be hazardous especially for the growing saplings of the mulberry plants. There is a basal dose of farmyard manure. You should remember that farmyard manure is a kind of manure which is prepared from different natural sources and this is totally, uh, uh, totally chemical fertilizer free or uh, kind of uh, kind of composition and you can apply this particular FYM at the rate of 20 tons per hectare okay, uh, before going for rowing your, uh, your sapling, before going for planting your sapling. There are different plant varieties used for the process of moriculture. Uh, but you have to select your own variety based on the fertility of the land, based on the geoclimatic region in which you are going for the cultivation, based on the water availability and other properties like your size of the garden, the soil properties, etc. You can use these particular varieties like S36, M5, V1 because these are high yielding varieties for the Indian subcontinent. Uh, there are certain other varieties also like AR12 which is suitable for the alkaline soil. So, you need to do a pH test before going for the mulberry cultivation I have already mentioned and if you find that your soil is little bit alkaline then you can choose the AR12 variety. 
K2, which is presently referred as M5 kind of variety, it's, a, it's also a superior variety which is responding well to the manure and it's capable of giving 25% more leaf yield than the other species. So, you can use this particular variety in the Indian subcontinent and one more interesting factor for this particular variety is this variety can thrive well in dry condition, in drought condition as well as well irrigated condition. You have to use certain manures and fertilizer for the growth and development of the mulberry plants. First you have to apply a basal dose of organic manure like compost or rather cattle manure which is available in the villages uh, of almost every household, uh, household and you can apply this particular FYM for the successful establishment of a garden. Periodically you can also use certain FYM, it may be a mixed kind of FYM uh, uh, at a rate of 20 ton per hectare per year in two doses following the first bottom pruning and then after the third bottom pruning. Fertilizers has to be applied as per the recommended schedule and as per the necessity of the micronutrients for your plant. So, you need to do a kind of profiling that these micronutrients are necessary in this particular soil or rather your soil is deprived of certain micronutrients then you have to compensate these micronutrients to your soil so that your moriculture, your mulberry cultivation manifest in leaps and bounds. You can also spray 1% boron solution or 0.5% urea or 0.1% zinc sulphate solution directly on the leaf surface to improve the quality of the leaves because the leaves gonna be the first feed of the larvae. The fertilizer doses are very interesting uh, but you have to choose uh, the fertilizer dose based on the size of the land, based on the geoclimatic condition, based on the harvest and based on the procedure you have opted for. You have to use a very good irrigation system and water supply since I have mentioned that the uh, plant species belonging to the genera morus require a good amount of water for the uh, development, for the growth. Regular irrigation at an interval of 1 week to 10 days is ideal. One irrigation channel for 2 rows of mulberry plants is sufficient. In case of the water scarcity, you can opt for drip irrigation and you can adapt for certain other varieties which can withstand the, uh, the drought condition. Now, uh, coming to the stages of moriculture, like how the mulberry cultivation to be executed in the agricultural perspective. So, first of all, you have to prepare your cultivation land. You need to prepare this, um, this cultivation land and you have to choose the variety of the mulberry plant which is suitable for your land condition, for your altitudinal condition, for your geoclimatic condition. Cuttings to be prepared from well matured 6 to 8 months old shoots. So, you can get the cuttings from well established garden and these cuttings are about, uh, about uh, 20, 15 to 20 centimeter in length and you can collect the cuttings from 1.5 centimeter uh, in diameter with four, 3 to 4 healthy buds coming from out from these cuttings. Now, uh, before planting the cuttings to the nursery beds, you need to prepare the nursery beds for the growth and development of these plants. The nursery beds of uh, 5 meter by 1.5 meter are very good for the growth and development of the, uh, of the saplings which will be coming out of the cuttings and then um, the land should be 30 centimeter to 40 centimeter in depth and the soil should be well pervalized. Uh, before uh, planting your cutting, uh, it is recommended that FYM or farmyard manure should be applied at the rate of 15 kg per bed and it should be mixed well so that your soil is fertile enough to retain, to manifest the growth and development of your sapling. 
some quantity of the sand can also be added because too much loamy nature of your land too much presence of moisture or water can also be disadvantageous for the mulberry plant so you can use certain amounts of sand uh, in order to make the soil little bit heavier some quantity of tank sealed and also other decomposed organic matter can also be applied to the sandy soil and it will increase the water holding capacity. Not only that, uh, the porosity of the soil will be getting increased. This will help in the growth and development of certain microorganisms which will be contributing the salts uh, of mainly NPK, the nitrogenous salts, the phosphate and the potassium salts. Cutting should be planted in nursery beds with a spacing of 15 centimeter by 10 centimeter. The full length of the cutting is pushed into the soil so that the so that the uh, the cutting is well uh, rooted later on and the bud is exposed above the ground. Nursery beds to be in irrigated twice a week and uh, after irrigation you should apply fertilizer at the rate of 25 is to 25 is to 25 of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium salts per kg per hectare after approximately one and a half months or five to six weeks when the plants are sprouting out of the cuttings and the root system of those cuttings are well established. The saplings of about 80 to 90 days that means almost three months old can be used for planting. Now you have to take those saplings and you have to put those saplings in your agricultural field but you should take care that the root system of those saplings are not damaged. So maximum care should be taken to avoid the damage of the root system. Planting to be done preferably in the rainy season because I have already mentioned that the mulberry plants are uh, moisture lover. So, uh, the peat system uh, of about 90 centimeter by 90 centimeter are very good uh, for, the, for the establishment of these saplings where the peats are about 3 centimeter cube in, uh, in volume and you can put the saplings over there. Later you can put these um, small digs with the FYM uh, at a ratio of 1 is to 2. There are trenchers like 35 centimeter to 35 centimeters which are also convenient for the plantation of your saplings. At least two weeding should be carried out. This is a very important problem in case of the agriculture. Those you have idea about agriculture from real life, life experiences or from other experiences, you should know or you uh, have the idea that the weeding is a very important procedure. Otherwise, the weed species uh, will be interfering in the growth and development of the mulberry plant species. So during the first six months the weeding should be carried out then after two months of planting and again at an interval of two to three months. Afterwards you can go for the first bottom pruning when your plant is approximately 20 to 25 centimeter uh, tall from the ground level. So there you can collect the leaves from the bottom uh, branches of the plant and uh, then followed by the second bottom pruning at the height of um, at the height of 30 centimeter but pruning is generally recommended during the months of January and February because this is the where this is the months uh, in which in especially in case of India the pruning procedure as well as the development of the leaves is a best time. Leaves should be uh, picked up in a proper time otherwise the leaves because of the natural procedure, natural physiological properties will be yellowed and will be shed. So this was all about from the procedure of mulberry cultivation but the farmer should have knowledge of certain diseases in order to save the mulberry plants from certain pests and parasites. So one should have this kind of training and the government may also take certain initiative in order to aware the 
farmers about these diseases to prevent the damages because the damage in the mulberry production is directly related with the increase in the silk price and also the market availability. So first disease which I will be talking about is the leaf spot. This is caused by Cercospora moricola. This is a mainly bacterial disease. Then another disease is the leaf rust which is caused by Serotolium fissi. Another disease is the powdery mild dew. You can see the whitish, whitish patches uh, at the under surface of the leaves. This is caused mainly by Phylactinia corylia and root knot. It's uh, another disease. You can see that this is the healthy root and this is the affected root uh, by the infection of Meloidogni incognita. Another disease which is very devastating for the mulberry production is the root rot which is caused by Rhizoctonia betaticola uh, previously known as Macrophomina phaseolina and there are certain associated microorganisms like Fusarium solani, Fusarium oxysporum, Botryodiplodia, Theobromi etc. which can also manifest the signs and symptoms of root rot in case of the mulberry cultivation. And uh, if you are a zoology enthusiast, you should find these kinds of pink mealy bugs uh, over the leaf surface which may damage the mulberry leaves which are the feeds for the silkworm. So Macronelicoccus hirsutus should be managed accordingly in order to get rid of uh, damages um, by these pests and parasites. So with this I am ending today's discussion. We will be back with certain other topics in some other uh, lecture series or some other classes. Uh, you are suggested to go through these particular books and you can also send me certain queries in the comment box section. And with this, thank you.